Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father <clears throat> and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit.
reading from the book of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Here endeth the first lesson.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of others? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister, or you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Here endeth the second lesson.
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but, I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here endeth the third lesson. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. It's been a long time since many of us were in church at all, and even those who have felt comfortable attending in person in this time of social distancing and staying safer at home, have had few opportunities for extended interactions with our sisters and brothers in Christ. We miss one another deeply. As we struggle to recognize each other behind our masks and wrestle with technology challenges to participate in constant Zoom conversations, the fabric of our community often feels strained. The Christians in Rome, according to the reading from Paul's letter this morning, were blessed with in-person interactions, but their community was strained by disagreements about what members should and shouldn't be eating. Paul warns them against such divisiveness and reminds them that judgment is for God, not for us. What distinguishes us Christians from the wider world is not our moral superiority, 
but our unity in the gospel. The oneness of the church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, demands that we remain with one another precisely in those places where we disagree. We too sometimes seem to forget what Paul is reminding the Roman Christians about. First, each Christian is a member of God's household. If God has accepted a person, who is in a position to condemn or exclude them? Second, Christian practices are all about building up the body and serving God in Christ. What one person does to honor God should not be condemned by others in the community. And third, each of us will have our day of judgment. And on that day, it will be God, not our brothers and sisters, who will sit in the judgment seat. The world will not know us by our perfect harmony, however. It will know us by our love. If we make the choice to remain in community with our fellow Christians, imitating God's loving choice to be with us in Christ, we become church and we model the unity of the gospel. But living in community is hard. It asks us to value right relationships over being right. It requires mutual forbearance, empathy and humility. And inevitably, it requires the ability to forgive. Our Gospel reading this morning continues a long discourse by Jesus on what it means to be community or church. He's talked about the perils of stumbling blocks, the importance of taking care of little ones, bringing back into community those who stray, and discreet correction as opposed to public shaming. Today, there's a lesson about the nature of forgiveness. Peter, as so often happens in the Gospels, has not quite grasped what Jesus is teaching, but he doesn't hesitate to ask the first question. He's aware of the requirement in Jewish tradition to forgive up to three times. And he knows that Jesus is always more radical in his teaching so forgiving someone seven times seems to Peter like going the extra mile. But Jesus has something very different in mind. Various translations of this passage from Matthew give various versions of Jesus' number. Some say 70 and 7, and some say 70 times 7. But the point is the same. Jesus is telling Peter that the number of times is infinite. You have to keep on forgiving and forgiving with no limits, just like God does. Because we are abundantly forgiven by God, we must abundantly forgive others. This is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I remember many years ago reading a reflection on the Lord's Prayer by C.S. Lewis, in which he described these lines as a bargain with God. I was completely taken aback. I had said the words so many times and never realized what my end of the bargain was. I am obliged to offer to others the abundant forgiveness that God offers to me. That was a real life changer. But if I'm honest, there are many times when I find myself behaving more like the man in today's parable of the unforgiving servant. It's difficult for all of us to be forgiven and forgiving people. In her book, Dead Man Walking, Sister Helen Prejean tells the story of Lloyd LeBlanc. His son was murdered, and when he arrived at the scene to identify him, Mr. LeBlanc knelt by the body and prayed the Lord's Prayer. As he prayed, he realized that he must forgive 
those who had trespassed against him by killing his son. He went on to tell Sister Helen that he has had to continue praying every day of his life not to be overcome by feelings of bitterness and revenge. Forgiveness is not a single action, but rather a way of life. We are called to forgive, but not to forget. Forgiveness does not eliminate the consequences of behavior, nor does it mean condoning what was done. The person responsible for Mr. LeBlanc's son's death did not avoid the judicial outcome of his actions just because he was forgiven. Justice is separate from forgiveness. Justice involves apologies, compensation, punishment, and restitution. Community integrity requires proper acts of remembering and amending injustice. As someone once said, you cannot talk your way out of a problem that you behaved your way into. In matters of justice, the human tendency is almost always towards retribution. Almost all religions and cultures have believed that sin and evil are to be punished and retribution demanded of the sinner in this world and sometimes in the next. Such retributive justice promotes a dualistic system of reward and punishment good people and bad people, that is carried out in prisons, courtrooms, wars, and sometimes churches. Restorative justice, on the other hand, provides an alternative path. Sin and failure are an opportunity for the transformation of the person harmed, the person causing harm, and the community. This is what Father Richard Rohr calls the economy of grace. It's about restoring relationships rather than blaming or punishing. Restorative justice requires a full and honest exposure of the truth, and it requires accountability. You cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. As James Baldwin wrote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. There's a story about a certain African tribe that recognizes that every soul has its own vibration, expressing its unique flavor and purpose. When a woman in the tribe knows she's pregnant, she goes out into the wilderness to pray and listen until she hears the song of the child she bears. Then the mother-to-be teaches the song to other members of the tribe. The tribe sings the song to the child at birth. They sing when the child becomes an adolescent, when the adult is married, and at the time of parting and death. But there is one other occasion when the community sings this song if at any time during his or her life the person causes suffering to another member of the tribe, they gather in a circle and set him in the center. They sing the song to remind him not of the wrong done, but of his own beauty and potential. When a child loses the way, it is love and not punishment that brings the lost one home. In the parable of the unforgiving servant, Jesus reveals a framework for forgiveness that is about mercy, compassion, and justice. It begins with the transgressor, the first servant, acknowledging the transgression and endeavoring to make amends. His debt is forgiven, but he fails to extend similar forgiveness to his fellow slave, and he pays a heavy price for that intransigence. As human beings, we may find ourselves on either side of that scenario. Sometimes we're the ones who need to admit that we've transgressed, to seek forgiveness, and to declare our commitment to make amends. At other times, we are the ones owed a debt. And unlike the servant in the parable, we must hear the acknowledgement of transgression and be ready to grant forgiveness 
when the offer to make amends is sincere. Similarly, as members of the larger community, we are not always on the same side of social justice or injustice. Sometimes we are in the place where we need to recognize that our privilege is the result of transgressions in the past, and we need to seek ways to address this. At other times, we can find ourselves in a place where we are called to offer forgiveness to those who are seeking to right the wrongs of the past and work towards a more just society. Inability to forgive, whether on an interpersonal or a community level, is disruptive and dis degrades the quality of community that God desires for us. As the social justice activist Brian Stevenson wrote, we are all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated. An absence of compassion can corrupt the decency of a community, a state, or a nation. Fear and anger can make us vindictive and abusive, unjust and unfair, until we all suffer from the absence of mercy and we condemn ourselves as much as we victimize others. We all need mercy, we all need justice, and perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. Human forgiveness is preceded and empowered by God's forgiveness, and it allows us to experience God's grace in one another. We are living now in a time of polarization and deep division. Red states and blue states are squaring off as we move towards a national election, and the coronavirus pandemic has revealed glaring economic disparities and social injustices that we have long tried to avoid confronting. And often, the church just reflects the wider culture and becomes a battleground where one person or one group asserts superiority over another. Sometimes the Bible and the tenets of the faith are forgotten as a means of peacemaking and reinvented as instruments of violence. That is not what God expects of us. As Christians, we are called to live out our baptismal promises, to persevere in resisting evil and whenever we fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord, to proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. And surely the pandemic has taught us that our lives clearly and literally are in each other's hands. We are connected in ways that are both terrifying and beautiful. Forgiveness, reconciliation, healing, and justice are the way to bring about the beloved community that is God's dream. That is the work to which God calls us. It will not be completed in our lifetime. It will take many lifetimes. Our job is to do as much as we can, where and when and how we can. And as Father Connolly reminded us last week, we can look for guidance to the words of the Old Testament prophet Micah. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Let us pray. Gracious God, you created us in your image. Give us the grace to turn our anger and outrage to justice and compassion. Transform our pain so that we may transmit love. <clears throat> Strengthen our bodies and our minds and our hearts for the long, hard, holy work of reconciliation and justice. Enable us through the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about the reign of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to be together as the body of Christ, whether we're here physically or whether you're with us uh, on Facebook Live or whether we're together right now or we'll be together later in the day. As the body of Christ, we're assured that Christ is with us. So it's good to be together. If you are visiting uh, on Facebook, visiting St. John's, we'd like to know more about you. So uh, send us an email at parish at stjohnstampa.org or uh, give us a call Monday through Thursday. Uh, the office will be open and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, our services continue. Uh, we'll continue streaming this service. We have a service at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning uh, without the choir. And we uh, offer a service of evening prayer on Facebook Live every day at 3 o'clock. So I hope you can join us for one or more of those services as we walk with Christ together. Uh, our, uh, uh, we depend uh, upon you for financial support. Uh, that hasn't changed. You've always been uh, very generous, and we appreciate it. There are many ways to give online or by text or by sending a check, and those are all detailed in the bulletin. However you decide to give and however much you decide to give, we're grateful for it, so thank you. I'd like to uh, clear up one question that I uh, have been asked, and that's why I'm here in a suit and sitting over there. Uh, we limit the chancel to three people for social distancing purposes, and I'm person number four, so I'm sitting over there. It's as simple as that. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to three things in the bulletin. First, uh, Mr. Morley is putting together a uh, hymn sing that will be recorded. As of Tuesday, he had about 60 requests. I don't think it'll be that long. So <laughs> if you have a hymn you would particularly like to hear, please be in touch with him uh, so he can consider including it in the repertoire. Uh, secondly, EYC is going to meet this afternoon. They're going to meet outside, so let's hope it's dry. Uh, although part of the games they're going to play involve water, so maybe it won't make any difference. Uh, there's information about that in the bulletin. And finally, the annual women's retreat will be on September 26th. Uh, that'll be for people physically at the St. Francis Center or uh, virtually uh, attending parts of it on Zoom. So, uh, depending on your preference, if that's something of interest to you, please be in touch with Deacon Moore and she can give you more information. Uh, and again, there's information about it in the bulletin. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
We pray for those for whom our intercessions have been requested. Harry, Baker, Mark, Robin, Jackie and family, Bill, Patty, Ansley and family, Nancy, Ray, Colin, Lynn, Tori and family, Astrid, Jeff, Sid, Clark, Suzanne, John and Suzanne, Nancy, Maureen, Michelle, Jonathan, Pat, Jerry, Baldwin, Janiel and family, Sally, Shirley, David, Jean, Betty, Pam, Nick, Marianne, and family, and the Huff family. We pray for our parish family, the clergy and staff of our parish, our pastoral care ministers, our parish day school, our companion diocese in the Dominican Republic, the members of our armed forces deployed abroad, especially Rich, Mike, and Jake. For ourselves and all those who are suffering the effects of the pandemic, we pray for health care workers, first responders, and all others whose work puts them in danger because of the pandemic. We give thanks for their many sacrifices for the common good. Protect them from injury and illness. Renew their wisdom, compassion, and strength. We pray for the departed. Bernarda, Salvatore, Burnt, and Neville. May their souls and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. We pray for our own needs and the needs of others. For the victims of wildfires in the western United States. For the unemployed and underemployed. We pray for work. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee, in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, 
and hast promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life everlasting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.